talk about a couple of uh, topics and maybe off general topic that we usually cover. Uh, the conflict in Eastern Europe has always held the potential to expand beyond the borders of Ukraine, uh, making World War III a possibility. I'm not trying to over-dramatize things, but the Ukrainian President Zelensky is trying really hard to get NATO militarily involved, and there are a lot of Beltway DC insiders trying to oblige him. Uh, most of them have a monetary tie to the defense industry, and all of these things are dangerous. But even though nuclear apocalypse is not likely, and I don't believe doomsday to be around the corner, when a lot of low likelihood events start to stack up, more opportunities for something to go wrong are created. So, uh, for example, a low likelihood event would be something like an expansion of the Russian-Ukraine war to a neighboring country, and the likelihood of disruptive cyber attacks. Uh, we're already seeing that. I mean, that, there's some frequency with cyber attacks already. You couple that with the risk of a policy misstep by the Fed, and then we get a severe economic reaction. Markets crash because uh, of you know extreme equity valuations, or a uh, recession could be caused by a spike in oil and food prices, which we've already seen. And then those things kind of drive, uh, this lack of availability kind of drives unrest. Each event on its own isn't going to be a world-changing event. But you throw all these things into the same pot, you turn up the heat, and there's a good chance that 2022 pops off with something ruinous, would be a charitable way of putting it. If you think it sounds far-fetched, consider that just last week, the potential was mentioned by President Putin from Russia that he would call up the Collective Security Treaty Organization, CSTO. Think of that like Russia's version of NATO. Inside the CSTO, you have Armenia, uh, Belarus, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Russia, and Tajikistan. So far, those countries have mostly stalled at joining this special military action Russia's taken off with in Ukraine. It looks like the Belarus army is, is still staging, and there are reports of a, a train in Kazakhstan carrying infantry fighting vehicles. But all of these things have a greater than zero chance of happening. A greater than zero chance of happening, meaning it's possible. And just yesterday, Russia announced they're going to nationalize foreign-owned companies that have pulled out of Russia that are uh, in opposition to or opposing Russia's operations down there. In other words, communism. Take over your company. We own it now. Now, considering all of that, I want to talk a little bit about what you, you and I, can do here at home. This topic might seem like a little deviation from training, and in a way, it's still related. You know, sometimes we'll talk about shooting and tactics, and sometimes we'll talk about surveillance detection or things to keep your family safe. This is along those same lines, just in another way. See, training helps you get ready for a time when you will need to perform a function, whether it's your job or whether you're acting in an emergency. Maybe you're putting out a fire. Maybe you're rendering medical assistance or defending your family, yourself, or somebody else. And similarly, being prepared sets you up to tackle an unknown event more effectively and efficiently than the guy who failed to plan. Think back to the China virus and the panic buying of toilet paper in 2020. Toilet paper. When people are stressed out, their reasoning is hampered, right? So they look at what other people are doing, and if other people are stockpiling, it leads them to engage in that same behavior, which then creates a run on a specific product which then, when you go into the store and see shelves are empty, creates this sense of urgency and, in some people, a sense of panic. Similarly, people bought that item, toilet paper, because it gave them something to do. Toilet paper isn't going to solve the problem of the COVID-19 planned a pandemic, but it gave them something to do. We're going to buy toilet paper. 
makes them feel better. It feels like they're taking control of a situation that they don't understand and a situation that they can't control. You don't want to be that person who doesn't know what they need or what they need to do. You've anticipated it. You've thought it through to a degree and you have a plan. Whether it's a loose plan or a firm plan, a plan is better than no plan at all and hope Hoping it's going to work out. Hope isn't a plan. So, here's the idea. The foundation is safety in numbers. And so, I'm going to address how to start and organize an area preparedness network. Building a local network. It's one of the most important things that uh, you can be doing now as the world seems to be spinning out of control. Let me explain what today is not about. This is not about advocating violence or engaging in any illegal activity. This is about developing a mindset, creating a system to help you, your family, and those in your area tackle an event, react to a natural or a man-made disaster. And essentially, this is about not being alone when you're facing the unknown. So, like a good Southern Baptist sermon, we're going to hit three points. First one's going to be five tips to get started. Second point's going to be how to organize. And then the third is briefly going to touch on what's an area of study and how do you do one. Now, I'm not talking about actually preparing for a specific event, so don't go down the road of this video thinking we're going to talk about how to plan for an EMP or a solar CME, or a nuclear war, or economic collapse, or hyperinflation, uh, low intensity conflicts, food scarcity, cyber attack. We're not going to talk about that. It's not specific. This is a conversation about principles, not tactics. Principles, not tactics. Here at our company, we teach the principles of fighting, not a specific technique to address a problem. Your technique might be within your own unit, or it might be within your own training. We're going to we teach concepts and principles, and then you can apply those universally. So instead, today, I want to talk about discussing preparing for follow-on effects. An economic collapse or hyperinflation isn't going to kill you. The resulting local violence, criminality, and dysentery from dirty water could kill you. And that's what we should really prepare for. And that's why you need local intelligence, because throughout history, intelligence has been a deciding factor in a victory or a defeat. An information sharing network is what we're looking at. That gives you a strategic advantage. If you don't have one, then building one should be your top priority. Also, I invite you to think about this from, from a different, different angle, right? I'm not a big fan of the idea of bugging out. I know that's a popular topic. People sell bug out bags. They do videos on what bug out equipment you need to carry and all of that. But being exposed, and it, it, you know, it's the Book of Eli and all those movies make it seem like, hey, that's the thing to do. It's not for me. Being exposed on the move, especially with children in tow, is a recipe for ambush. It's super dangerous to be on the road in an event like that. In fact, when I worked for my uncle, if we had a plan, if we had to plan a meeting for a like a high ranking person and we had to take them to a super sketchy location, I, you know, we wouldn't want to drive in there. What we do is if we had the opportunity and the assets available, we would fly them in, leave the engines running on a plane, drop the ramp, make the contact come to us, search them, bring them on board, and do the meeting on the aircraft. Put guys outside on the ground, put guys inside the craft, and that's where the meeting would be held. If things went sideways, either inside the uh, aircraft or outside on the tarmac, we'd either throw the dude out the door and take off or strap him down and he'd get a free trip somewhere with us, but we're out of there. The point is that we avoided open road movements as much as we could because they're dangerous. In places like Afghanistan or Iraq, uh, we would armor up a taxi cab, tint the windows, 
and dress like locals and try to blend into the local traffic pattern if we had to move about on the roads during daylight hours. Road travel can be deadly. On multi-lane highways, if we had to go under an overpass, right? You know the kind, you've got like three lanes here, three lanes going the other way, an overpass, you've got to drive underneath that thing. As soon as we entered underneath the overpass, we would switch lanes as fast as we could before exiting on the other side. That way, if somebody's hiding on top of the overpass, you know, sometimes they would drop grenades or drop explosives down on trying to drop it in a vehicle on top of a vehicle. This way, we'd come out on the side they didn't expect. We're in the different lane than what they thought, and they couldn't catch it, maneuver it in time. They drop it in the wrong lane. Did I mention that road travel can be deadly? Plus, who knows your area around your home better than you do? Your neighbors and you watch each other's property. Mine do. If they're out of town, I know it. I put their garbage cans out. If I'm out of town, they watch mine. We've got three or four neighbors around here that just kind of watch out after each other. You know what your vehicles in your area look like, too, on your road or your street. You know basically what your schedules are for the people that live around you. So you have a de facto network, and you can mount a unified defense from your area together if you had to, assuming you have people that are physically capable. So instead of thinking about preparing as an individual or a family, I mean, I know Rambo concept is, you know, right out there, made some good movies and stuff, but safety numbers. Think bigger. Think about how you can build a network and develop intelligence to improve local security and stability at your place. So let me step back and explain the thought process here. And it's a, it's a concept called first and second order thinking. First order thinking is thinking like within the box thinking. That's something everybody's familiar with. You're thinking inside the box. First order thinking looks for easy answers driven by our past experiences, our past beliefs. It puts more weight on the immediate effect of our actions and it ignores the subsequent impact of what we're doing and how that might affect things. When we seek uh, instant gratification, our first order thinking is at play. It is safe, it is superficial, it is reactionary, it's obvious, it's fast, it's easy, and it's conventional with a focus on the immediate impact. That is first order thinking. Second level thinking or second order thinking is hard. And this looks beyond your current assumption and your beliefs. And it requires a massive effort to dig out the potential impact of uh, our decisions that, that are going to impact the future. Second order thinking is hard, it's complex. Uh, it's uncertain, it's unconventional, and it's got, it, there's a desire there to explore future consequences and to maximize its benefit. That's second order thinking. So how do we apply that, hope I didn't lose you there, to preparedness? Like this, first order thinking would be accumulating stuff to help you survive. That's easy. You make a list, you buy junk, you stick it in your closet. That's first order thinking, right? Hoarding for situation. Second order thinking might be using your preparedness network's collective political, social, and economic power to improve local security and stability. That is harder. That takes more time. That takes more effort. However, down the road, that is going to get you further than having a year's supply of toilet paper. So let's start small. This is point number one. I told you we hit three points. These are five tips that get you going about building a county or a regional preparedness network. You can start, number one, by asking friends and family to join if you're comfortable doing that. So that's the first, first tip. Ask and invite people that you know, that you may be related to or good friends with. Second one is a good neighborhood watch. Kind of touched on that already is a de facto information sharing network. Start one or join one. You don't need 100% participation. Even passive support should be counted as a win. Even getting just one person on board is a net win. So you can check out like National Neighborhood Watch websites in your area and they'll give you details. I'll tell you another idea is the Ring Doorbell system is a high-tech example of this thing. It has a neighbor's function where people, I'm not selling Ring Doorbells, don't get me wrong, 
but it's got a neighbors function in the app where people in the area share information and snapshots or video from their cameras about crime or suspicious things that have taken place near the home within a radius that you set in the app. So you can kind of get an intel picture of crowdsource information about what's going on in your zone. So that's another tip. Next, look up local training facilities and stores that might be interested in helping you spread the word about your, your network you're trying to put together. See if these places would be interested in maybe hosting a monthly meeting or uh, having some preparedness trainers come in. These could be great places to find other people who share the same concerns that you've got. They just they didn't know what to do. They didn't have an, an avenue to move forward on for that. Sometimes country and talk radio stations, next point, will have a community calendar, a feature um, either on their website or on the air, where they share information about nonprofit events. Um, at the point where you become whatever county preparedness and are holding a monthly meeting, see if your local radio will help you advertise. They might. And lastly, a former agency colleague of mine has a preparedness network in his area and they hold monthly meetings which includes an S2 brief that's from him and I'll explain what S2 is later some of you already know but he, it includes an S2 brief from him and typically some sort of training that is a monthly thing like in January they had a local paramedic teach about cold weather injuries uh, February they had a ham radio guy come in and give a class on establishing a VHF UHF comms network uh, so find some topics that you or somebody else can teach and just start inviting people who might be interested in showing up. It's a way to get off the ground. Uh, so those are some jumpstart tips. Now let's talk about how to set it up. This is point number two of our three that I told you we'd hit. How to organize this thing. I've been around the world with guerrilla fighters and setting up paramilitary forces to fight dictators, the Taliban, ISIS. Uh, setting them up from scratch is a chore, and it is an absolute chore. It's dangerous, and there are, but there are lots of ways to organize. Uh, but the U.S. military, the U.S. government, actually already has a really great organizational model, believe it or not. So, instead of recreating the wheel, we'll just use that. The Army staff system is, a, is, is good for key roles and responsibilities. And think of it like um, a steering committee, right? These are the people who keep the network moving. Now, I mentioned S2 a little before, and this is how this comes into play. You have the S1, staff 1, that's admin and personnel. S1 is the person responsible for contacting members, maybe distributing key information like when are we going to meet next, uh, updates to what's going on, kind of the news of the day type thing. And they're also in charge of outreach, right, recruitment, if you will. So that's S1. S2, that is intelligence and security. This person is responsible for updating members on concerns at the local level as well as what's happening at the national and strategic level. This also helps direct the group's focus, like uh, warning about a future increase to food cost, warning about decreased availability so that you can prioritize local food sources for your network. So that's the S2. The S3, sorry, 3. <laughs> that's operations and training. And this person is responsible for lining up training opportunities that are A, realistic, B, beneficial to the folks getting it done. Uh, you don't want to class in underwater BB stacking. Think medical classes like treating cold or hot weather injuries and, or stop the bleed classes, how to expand your pantry, financial preparedness, and you know, active shooter considerations. There are lots of online courses the, uh, that FEMA offers and uh, private companies offer some online courses that are free that will give you a certification and certain uh, skills. So that's the S3, Operations and Training. <clears throat> now we go to S4. S4 is Logistics and Supply. Sometimes you need specialty items for preparedness projects and sometimes things just break. And so it's good having a guy who can turn a wrench and fix things or find parts um, for just about anything, the scrounger. Make a gear list. For the next time you head out for a hurricane, you know, for the hurricane or flood recovery, 
and the S4 can help source that equipment for your group as you go out to help your neighbors recover from you know an event. All right, so we went from S4, and then we skip S5 because that went away a long time ago. It's um, it doesn't it's irrelevant. Next is S6, and that's the last one. S6 is uh, signal and communications, and whether it's one guy or a team uh, doing the work, establishing an area comms plan is important. Being able to communicate is important. Having your own VH or UHF uh, ham radio op or repeater when cell towers go down is a major advantage. And the S6 makes this sort of thing possible. And there are other options in ham, but ham is kind of local and worldwide at the same time. So I hope that gives you a little direction on building out a preparedness network. Even if you can't fill out each staff member now, the S's, keep recruiting and organizing and you'll eventually get there. When it comes time to decide what to teach next, your, your S guys task them or your, your people in your network task them to teach what they know or prepare some research and share it with the group. Uh, for example, you could, you know, hey, it's warming up outside guys, here's some pictures of this area's poisonous snakes and spiders, um, here's how you identify them and here's what to do if somebody gets bitten. Or a class on three ways to purify water or how to keep backyard chickens, you know, the list is endless. But beyond monthly meetings, Having members uh, hop in a secure chat group to link uh, for sale ads and discounts on gear is a good idea. We recommend the Signal app. It's uh, crowd. It's open source as far as the code goes. It's free, and it actually was recommended by the Senate Intelligence Committee for their members to use as a comms platform. Don't use WhatsApp. Don't use Telegram. Those are compromised, and every time Signal finds a glitch, they patch that thing and it's worldwide as far as people being able to look at their code. So we recommend that for a uh, secure communications uh, using uh, the internet and phone systems. So, you know, people share news, people share local concerns, and a lot of other valuable information. And so it's kind of a, a value added benefit for new members too who are just kind of getting into preparedness and having questions to get into some, some sort of a secure group chat. And, and the, you know, the other thing is building these relationships will be a blessing, um, even if the world doesn't end. But if, if we do get into something really bad, then the skills, the knowledge, and the bonds you developed are going to make you better able to withstand the storm. So finally, uh, you know, kind of let me end with something concrete that you can do as you begin putting your networks together. We would do this as part of the preparation before going into a hostile area uh, to work with, train, and fight alongside locals in a foreign country. But the concepts apply to your own ability to protect and defend your family, your friends, your, your area, your neighborhood. And that's an area study. In, in future emergencies and disasters, whether it's a natural or man-made, there will be things that we don't know, but that we need to know, right? These are blind spots, and they will affect our ability to make a good decision, to take a good decision. What's the worst thing that can happen? Well, these blind spots, they force you to make a bad decision. Or, second option would be, these blind spots don't trigger a decision at all. The technical term for this blind spot is an intelligence gap or a piece of information we wish we knew, but we don't. So some examples of information you wish you knew, but maybe you don't. What gangs operate in my city or my county? Which roads or bridges are flooded or are prone to flood? Around here where I live, that's a problem in this beach ocean zone. Which radio frequencies are local ham operators using to communicate? What route is best if I need to evacuate the area? Primary roads, secondary roads? Okay, do those roads flood? See how these things start to overlap. What are the area threats that I've failed to identify or consider? Uh, where's the closest uh, level one trauma center? Where's the closest police department? Where's the closest fire department to you? Which members of my neighborhood? 
will partner with me to ensure community security. And here's a good one. Which members of my neighborhood will oppose my efforts to ensure community security? These are questions that uh, I've asked myself. Um, I've done this, gosh, for decades overseas. But one way to shore up these gaps is you do an area study. The area study, it informs us of the local players, the conditions, the fault lines, the assets, the threats, the vulnerabilities, uh, the opportunities, and the effects that will make or break our preparedness and our security planning. If your biggest concern is a tornado or an ice storm that blows over in a day, you may not need an area study. That's, you know, it's over in a day. Get your chainsaw out, cut some limbs, move some things, clean your driveway off, there you are. But if you're concerned about that one event that happens every 20 years, or something that may not end in hours, but more like days, or more like weeks, or maybe months, then you should have an area study done. You should do it. If you're concerned about events with a much higher likelihood, such as the dollar's loss of world reserve status, which I'm stepping out of limb here, but it is 100% guaranteed to happen. The collapse of the American empire. Unfortunately, that looks like it is also going to happen. A monetary crisis. That's going to happen. An economic crisis. That is 100% going to happen. Or a fourth turning triggered by a contested presidential election or domestic terrorism, insurgency, or revolution. Unfortunately, in my opinion, that's probably on the table as well. If you're concerned about those types of events, you absolutely need to do an area study. So then mind, what goes into an area study? Well, here are my six layers that I think need to be considered that when I've gone overseas I these are the six things that I kinda look at I wanna look at the physical terrain first I wanna get a map out I wanna get you know the electronic map paper map I wanna see the mountains the rivers the bridges that can if that could affect me my team and our operation our objective so the physical terrain then I also want to look at the second layer, which is the human terrain. That is the beliefs, the attitudes, the behavior, and the culture of people around you. The human terrain. Then there's the third layer, the critical infrastructure. These are the things that keep your world spinning. Critical infrastructure. Then you look at politics and governance. That's the next layer. Those are the people who make decisions that could affect you. The next layer is the military, security, and law enforcement layer. These are the people with guns and badges who could affect you. Okay. Now the last layer, economics and finance. The companies and the money interest that could affect you. So... I would do these things overseas. If I went into, say, Morocco, I would want to know what do the cops look like? What distinguishes them from the military? Is there a federal level cop? Is there a state level cop? Are they plain clothes? What do they dress like? What do they drive? I want to know these types of things. So if you go through each one of these layers and you find all the local characteristics that can or will positively or negatively affect you, then you'll know exactly what you should be. That's the thing for which you should be preparing. So no, no amount of beans, bullets, and band-aids, or toilet paper can overcome a, an abundance of intelligence gaps or a lack of situational understanding. And yet, you know, most of the professional preppers don't understand this. And we hope, you know, we, we hope this kind of out-of-character video will be useful to you. Um, if you've got questions or comments or suggestions, let us know. Please share this channel and subscribe and click that bell for when new videos get uploaded. And We appreciate you. God bless you and God bless the United States of America.